The next item of business is a member's debate on motion 2197 in the name of Colin Smith on Marie Curie report on challenging inequities in palliative care. The debate will be concluded without any questions being put. May I ask those members who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons. And I call on Colin Smith to open the debate. Around seven minutes, please, Mr Smith. Thank you, President Officer. Can I refer members to my register of interest where it states I was employed by Parkinson's UK when I was elected to Parliament, but that employment um, has ceased. I want to begin by, by thanking members from across Parliament for supporting my motion, allowing what is a, a timely debate on palliative care to take place today. It's just over a year since the, the Health and Sport Committee published it, its thorough and far-reaching report, We Need to Talk About Palliative Care. This was followed by the, the publication of the Scottish Government's strategic framework on palliative care and end-of-life care, a framework with a vision that everyone in Scotland who needs care has access to it by 2021, a vision I know all members share and support. So it's an opportune time to take stock to reflect on what progress has been made in achieving this vision and what more needs to be done over the next five years to ensure it becomes a reality. Marie Curie's excellent report, Enough for Everyone, Challenging Inequities in Palliative Care, is an important contribution to that debate. It brings together the key findings from discussions from a seminar held on the 15th of September 2016 by Marie Curie, where over 70 experts from across the country came together to talk about the challenges of inequities in palliative care and to seek solutions. The report highlights the research commissioned by Marie Curie and published by the London School of Economics in 2015 that showed it is estimated that one in four people in Scotland who die miss out, miss out on vital palliative care. That's an estimated 11,000 people in Scotland who need palliative care each year but don't receive it. It's also important to recognise the benefits of specialist palliative care for people with long-term conditions such as Parkinson's and other progressive neurological conditions from the point of diagnosis and not just for those requiring end-of-life care. So it's clear that, that over the next five years, over 55,000 people in Scotland may not receive the palliative care they need if we do not ensure that the vision of care for everyone who needs it is delivered. By delving below these figures and highlighting the barriers those who receive less care than others with comparable needs, the work by Marie Curie makes a significant contribution to the debate on how we can deliver that vision. Whilst it's not an exhaustive list, the report shows specific groups of people less likely to receive palliative care, including those over 85, those from black, Asian and minority ethnic communities, those who live alone and those who live in areas of deprivation. If we look at each of those groups in turn, we can see some of the reasons for these inequities. In Scotland, nearly 82% of deaths occur in people over 65. Yet older people are much less likely to receive the palliative care they need at the end of life when compared to younger age groups. Marie Curie highlights a number of reasons for this, including the fact that all too often older people may think their illness is just them getting old. There are also factors around the, the under-reporting of serious illnesses and under-identification of older people for palliative care. And this becomes more complex around the issue of frailty, with frail older people often dying without a defined single terminal illness and without re receiving the benefits of palliative care. A number of recommendations are made in the Marie Curie report to help tackle this. For example, providing clearer information for older people as to what services are available to them and how to access them. More effort is needed to identify triggers for palliative care in older people, particularly those with frailty. And practitioners need the right training and support to ensure that those who require palliative care are identi identified from the point of need. The challenges of inadequate training and support has also been identified by Marie Curie as creating a barrier to palliative care for those from black, Asian, minority and ethnic backgrounds. There are now more than 200,000 people living in Scotland from a BAME background, double the level of 2001. However, many don't access the palliative care when they need it. The Marie Curie report highlights the fact that when people do receive care, it's not always sensitive to the different cultural and religious needs of BAME groups. There's also a fear of discrimination, a lack of translation services, and a shortage of female doctors for Muslim women. So as well as more training and support for those providing palliative care, Marie Curie highlights a need for more research at ground level in the field of care to ensure that the needs of those living in BAME communities are being identified and evidence-based solutions are found to meet those needs. 
Research fun fun funded by Marie Curie into access to palliative care for lesbian, gay, bisexual and transgender people also found that discrimination and a fear of stigma was a factor when it came to accessing palliative care for LGBT people. There's also a clear dispar disparity in the access of health and social care services between those living in the most and least deprived communities throughout the country. For example, the report highlights that those living in the most deprived communities are 33% less likely to die at home compared to those living in the least deprived communities. Again, a number of reasons are given as to why people from deprived communities may not be accessing the palliative care in the Marie Curie report, and the need for far more public health and social care support in deprived areas is recommended as one way to help break down those barriers. So it's clear from the report that there are significant inequities when it comes to the provision of palliative care across Scotland. And if, if we are to meet the 2021 vision, we need to break down those barriers. The Marie Curie report highlights a number of recommendations and common themes that can help us do that. One such theme is around research and data. Professor David Clark, who members will know, leads the University of Glasgow's End of Life Studies Group based in Dumfries, stated in the report for the Health and Sport Committee in 2015 that a serious information deficit needs to be filled on data relating to the provision of palliative care in Scotland. There is clearly a distinct lack of research in palliative care compared to other health issues. I'm pleased the Government acknowledges this in the strategic framework, so I hope when the Minister is responding to the debate today, she can outline how the Scottish Government plans to support the development of an evidence base to show progress towards its 2021 vision. The forthcoming National Review of Health and Social Care targets also provides an opportunity to reconsider the current indicators used by health and social care partnerships when measuring palliative care to ensure that better data can be collected to fully measure the inequities that exist. For example, measuring access by clinical condition and socio-economic group. Breaking down the barriers highlighted by Marie Curie means providing personalised, effective palliative care in a setting that suits the individual. So it was encouraging to read in the Government's Health and Social Care Delivery Plan, published last month, that the availability of care options will be improved by doubling the palliative and end-of-life provision in the community. So I hope the Minister will outline how exactly this can be achieved. Will it, for example, mean additional resources for integrated joint boards to scale up their palliative care provision in the community? The final theme I want to touch on that comes from the report is once again the fact that talking about palliative care and dying does not come naturally to many, including myself, even although death is the most unavoidable event in all our lives. Of all the areas in the government's framework, I think this area is the one that least progress has been made. The Health and Sport Committee wrote to the Cabinet Secretary on the 16th of November about progress in the implementation of the framework. And in the reply, the Cabinet Secretary said the government did not plan to run a national campaign in relation to death and dying. I'd therefore be keen to know from the, the Minister how the government intends to deliver the commitment to support greater public discussion on death and dying and care at the end of life. Presiding officer, I'm very conscious of time, and although I've only been able to touch on a, a fraction of the issues in this report, I know other members will more than adequately fill the gaps I've left. I look forward to listening to those contributions and also to listen to the Minister on, on the points I've raised. But in conclusion, I, I want to place on record my thanks to Marie Curie, not only for their work on the report we are debating today, but the outstanding care and support they provide for over 8,000 people and their families across Scotland. Those thanks, of course, extend beyond Marie Curie to all the organisations involved in the delivery of palliative care, whether they are a charity, or amazing NHS staff, or a local council third, or private sector social care provider. The focus on my contribution has been on tackling the inequities in the provision of palliative care, but I know that tens of thousands of families benefit from the outstanding palliative care being delivered across Scotland every year. However, we are ambitious, and that is why we are all determined to see the Government ensure that care is there for everyone who needs it, wherever they live and whatever their background. Thank you. Uh, we move to the open speeches of around four minutes, please. Can I have Bob Doris, followed by Donald Cameron? Uh, th thanks, President Officer. And can I start by thanking Colin Smith for bringing this matter to, to, to Parliament uh, today? Uh, and also in Marie Curie and their excellent report on challenging inequalities in, in palliative care. Um, I'm a, I was the deputy chair of the health committee when that report was been drafted, and I'm currently, along with Colin Smith, on the cross-party group in palliative care. But I wanted to speak today from a more personal point of view. Uh, in December 2015, my mum passed away frail, elderly, and had been admitted to a care home a year earlier. The underlying reason for her passing away was vascular dementia. Mum passed away. 
and a hospital. In May 2016, my dad passed away at St Margaret's Hospice in Clydebank. He had been diagnosed with lung cancer a few months earlier. I mention them for two reasons. Firstly, I like talking about them. I think it's important we continue to talk about people who have lost. That's part of dealing with, with grief. Um, but also because the two very different, uh, different end-of-life pathways, if, if you like, in relation to palliative care. Uh, and the motion before us and Marie Curie's report uh, be believes more needs to be done to identify the triggers for when palliative care should kick in. And I would contend that actually quite often it kicks in, but we don't call it palliative care. And indeed, there's no agreed definition of what palliative care actually is, and that's a bit of a stumbling block as well. Um, in my dad's case, it seemed fairly clear it was cancer. That was terminal. Um, can you stay at home? That's just not a starter when you deteriorate. Let's look to see if a hospice place is available. I'll be forever grateful for the support that St Margaret's and Clydebank um, gave uh, to, to my father. Uh, but we have to go beyond the the traditional routes to palliative care for certain types of terminal illnesses and cancers, obviously, one where there's a clear pathway, others not so much. I should put on record uh, that Marie Curie's uh, hospice is indeed in my constituency of Maryhill Springburn, and they do an excellent, excellent job. In the last year, they've had 486 admissions. Uh, they've got 30 beds there, and they do a wonderful job, not just uh, in the hospice, but also across the wider community with a lot of nurse specialists and a variety of support they give my constituents, uh, not just in Hill Springburn, but others elsewhere. But if we were to look at uh, my mother's situation, um, staying at home didn't become an option for her. She had to go into residential care. Um, not, we didn't think at the time it was because of the vascular dementia. We just saw a frail elderly lady but vascular dementia is, is terminal. Um, I have no idea if my mother counted as receiving palliative care or not. It was with the well, it was, there was a well-intentioned murkiness around it, because care, care home staff don't like to talk about, you know, your loved one will eventually pass away. Um, what happens if her heart gives way? That's not what happened, incidentally. But what happens if her heart gives way? Do you want her to be resuscitated or not? These are really challenging conversations that are not just clinical-led conversations, but often relatively low-paid care staff and care homes having chats with a family about a, a, you know, what, what they would like to see with loved ones. So I think the more general point I want to make is I think every day of the week there's amazing contributions to palliative care happening at home with care at home staff, care home staff and hospice staff and beyond. I don't think we count it. I don't think we define it. I don't think we we'll always appreciate it, and a lot more has to be done. Um, it's also worth saying that I think Professor David Clark was quite right in his powerful report that he did for the Health and Sport Committee, but he also said that you know, we should remember palliative care in Scotland is probably still, and this is not a boast I have to say, probably about the best in the world. Everyone's playing catch up, but there's so, so much more we have to do. We haven't even begun scratching beneath the surface. Can I just give one final uh, comment, presiding officer? Um, not everyone is going to get the specialist palliative care. It doesn't mean um, that you go to a hospice, but I think hospices have got a huge contribution to make to the wider community, whether they become hubs of the wider community and they have strong networks with local care homes and local care home providers and uh, care staff that support um, those frail elderly at home. We should draw on their excellence, we should draw on their expertise, but we should expand what we do in the community. But the biggest thing we have to do in the community, I think, is talk about death and dying and appreciate the fantastic work that already goes on out there. And I thank Colin again for bringing this uh, debate to the Parliament. I look forward to working collegiately across all parties and with the government to improve the situation in palliative care. I call Donald Cameron to be followed by Elaine Smith. <coughs> Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I'd like to begin by thanking Colin Smith for bringing this issue forward for debate. And it's especially relevant given the shifting changes that we're witnessing to the way that health and social care is delivered. And also in the spirit of the ongoing debate as to how we deliver health care as a whole. I'd also commend Bob Doris for his eloquent description of his parents' deaths. Um, that frank recounting of his own personal experience says far more than any dry statistic that I or others might recite. 
Um, I'd also like to thank Marie Curie for providing extensive evidence in advance of this debate, including some in-depth analysis already referred to into a variety of minority groups who face particular challenges. And I look forward to hearing the contributions of others in relation to this issue. However, I want to begin by talking about the way that palliative care is delivered in my own region, the Highlands and Islands, and concentrate on the role of hospices in Scotland in particular. Despite the obvious challenges that my region faces on a daily basis, given its rurality and relative remoteness, whether that's about infrastructure or lack of clinical services or the struggle to attract professionals to take up jobs, we are lucky that we have incredible and dedicated staff in the public and charitable sectors who provide that quality and dignified end-of-life care to thousands of people each year. In the Highlands and Islands, charities such as Marie Curie work in close partnership with our NHS and provide support to two hospices in my region, the Highland Hospice in Inverness and the Bethesda Hospice in Stornoway. And across Scotland as a whole, Marie Curie has four volunteer helper groups and a vital befriending service that pairs some of the near 2,000 volunteers with those who require care and additional support. Such support is vital and we can and must continue to improve what we offer to patients who require end-of-life care and also to their families. I've also been privileged to visit the Cowell Hospice Trust in Danoon, which is located within the community hospital there. And I've been there twice since the election and had the pleasure of meeting staff and seeing the facilities on offer. It's a small hospice, but it provides incredible palliative care to local people, meaning that residents don't have to travel long distances to receive end-of-life care and can remain close to family and friends. And it's also a hospice with strong community backing and with premises and equipment largely funded through local fundraising efforts. However, the reality is that that's rather unique, not only to my region, but to Scotland as a whole. As Hospice UK note in their briefing, Access to hospice and palliative care in Scotland is not equitable, with thousands missing out on the care they need each year. Uh, and as the motion notes, that's about 11,000 approximately each year. In many instances, those who require specialist palliative care in rural and remote areas either have to travel, which can entail a variety of additional problems, or need to rely on such care being provided at a primary care level by a local GP or a nurse. When I delivered my maiden speech to Parliament, I spoke about the need for a greater focus on delivering vital services to people, especially those who live on the periphery of Scotland. This is the challenge we must face it head on. One example of how we could improve the accessibility to palliative care is by piloting the Partnership for Excellence in Palliative Support, the PEP scheme, which has been trialled by Sue Ryder in NHS Bedfordshire in England and was supported in my party's manifesto at the recent elections. PEPS involves the creation of a 24-hour phone line for access to all palliative care services. And it brings together 15 organizations in a hub and spoke model. And it's just one example of integrating existing services better and massively improving access to vital specialist information. Deputy Presiding Officer, this is a vitally important, important issue and I look forward to hearing other contributions today on how we develop palliative care in Scotland and ensure that the issues raised in Marie Curie's report are not only given proper attention, but that we, that we move forward to finally resolving many of the issues which remain outstanding. Elaine Smith to be followed by Alison Johnson. Thank you very much, President Officer. Scotland has many organisations and charities that focus on those either in need of palliative care or coming to the end of their lives, and this is a good opportunity to commend them and thank them all for the work they do as Donald Cameron has indeed just done. Today, thanks to Colin Smith, we're looking specifically at Marie Curie's report, Enough for Everyone, which has raised awareness of the inequities in access to palliative care. Marie Curie nurses themselves, of course, offer much needed uh, care and support to people living with terminal illness in the comfort of their own homes. And I'm sure we've all encountered their excellent uh, work, whether as politicians or personally. It's also important that I think that we recognise the great work done in hospices around Scotland. And an excellent example in my own region is St Andrew's Hospice in Airdrie. The hospice provides care to people living with life-limiting illness and, and uh, free to all, regardless of age, gender or creed, and it supports families. And it's a real example of the kind of care I think that this report would like to see across Scotland. Presiding officer, like myself and my husband, the hospice just celebrated its peril anniversary. 
And for the past 30 years, many families in the Lanarkshire area, including my own, have had experience of the exemplary care they provide. I am also proud to be an ambassador for the hospital's capital appeal, which needs to raise £9 million to refurbish the inpatient unit. And that is quite a task, because it is in addition to the £4.6 million needed every single year to continue the work they do, supporting and caring for patients, their families and loved ones. Now, they have produced a little book called uh, Perils of Wisdom, and that contains inspirational and thought-provoking contributions to help raise funds. And one of the quotes in the book is from Cecily Saunders, founder of the modern hospice movement, if I could just share it with you, which says, you matter because you are you, and you matter until the end of your life. President officer, a much uh, under-reported issue that I would like to touch on now is access to palliative care for babies, children and young people. This was identified by the Children in Scotland Requiring Palliative Care Study. And it found that over 15,000 babies, children and young people aged 0 to 25 years live with life-shortening diagnosis, and that two-thirds of them who die each year in Scotland do so without access to specialist palliative care and support. Now, this is a very difficult issue to talk about. Um, Colin Smith referred to such difficulties earlier, but it is one that needs addressed. Overall, we must find ways to encourage people to access the palliative care they need. And the Marie Curie report tells us that people living in more socially deprived areas are much less likely to access health and social care services, and that includes children and young people. It's, I'm sure that most people in the Chamber, most members, would agree, in fact, all of us would agree, it's unacceptable that people are dying in hospital waiting in social care packages. So it's imperative that people are properly supported to live and die at home as they wish to. And everyone affected by terminal illness should have access to all of the care and support they need, regardless of their personal circumstances, and that includes palliative care. President officer, I'm going to finish by picking another pearl of wisdom from the book to share with the Chamber. And it is, sometimes what a person needs is not a brilliant mind that speaks, but a patient heart that listens. So can I just say thank you to all the kind and patient-hearted staff and volunteers who provide palliative and end-of-life care. And I urge the government um, to quickly make their vision a reality so that everyone who needs palliative care has access to it in an equal way. And thanks again to Colin Smith for raising this vitally important issue in the Chamber. Alison Johnson and then Richard Lyle. Um, thank you, Deputy <coughs> Presiding Officer, and I too would like to thank Colin Smith for bringing this important issue to the Chamber this afternoon. And I'd also like to thank colleagues um, for their moving and well-informed contributions. I'm very pleased to contribute to today's debate, and I'd especially like to thank Mary Curie, Sue Ryder, the Royal College of Nurses, and Hospice UK for, for their excellent briefings on this important issue. Marie Curie's report into the inequalities in accessing palliative care is timely, and it highlights where our focus needs to be to ensure that our health service not only strives to allow everyone to live well, but to die well. Around 54,000 people in Scotland die each year, and with an increasingly ageing population, population, this figure is set to rise, with the government anticipating a 12% increase by 2037. The demands for end-of-life care will surely grow in response to this, as will the needs of those seeking palliative care. From palliative care's roots in the 1960s, providing meaningful pain management, care and emotional support to those with terminal cancer, today's palliative care must meet the challenges of a wide range of conditions. And Marie Curie's report outlines how health and social care providers need to recognise the needs not only of those with terminal illnesses, but those living with increasing frailty in their later years. Today's care must also respect and respond, and, and Colin Smith spoke to this very well, to the cultural needs of different groups in our society, for example, those of minority ethnic backgrounds and those identifying as LGBTQI. The report also notes that the challenges to accessing healthcare services faced by those living in areas of social deprivation extends into palliative and end-of-life care. The government's strategic framework for action sets out the steps we need to take to begin to set and measure indicators of palliative care provision across the country to ensure that everyone has access to the support they need by 2021. And it is that challenge of providing meaningful care to which I'd now like to turn. 
and preparing for this debate, a common theme that has been raised across the third sector, across the NHS, in government, indeed in our neighbourhoods and communities, is the need for a more open culture around death and dying. Our healthcare workers, workers will struggle to provide meaningful care if we're not ready to have frank and honest conversations about what a good death means to us as individuals, as families and communities. The Grasping the Nettle report from the Scottish Network for Palliative Care highlights that a cultural shift is needed for us to be willing to discuss these matters and that everyone has a part to play in bringing this about, not just care providers. The report says that too often our culture sees death as a medical failure, blocking discussions about what it means to die well and how our services can fulfil that need. And while current policy focus on increasing independence in old age is essential for our ageing society, I believe that this must also be balanced with policies and actions that recognise that sometimes ill health and death is inevitable. And I know the, the Minister for Public Health attended the Realistic Medicine event that probably several of us were at last night. And I think that shared decision-making um, around some of these big issues and you know, the opportunity to have a positive discussion about quality of life and what it means is truly welcome. Presiding officer, we need to ensure that primary health workers have all the training and support required to open these compassionate discussions about what treatment and emotional support a person may want at the end of their life. Everyone should have the opportunity to plan ahead to tell their carers what matters to them personally. Grasping the Nettle Report and Sue Ryder recommend a 24-7 helpline to palliative care professionals for patients to ensure people feel they've got a sense of autonomy and control in making these important decisions about the end of, of their lives and the care they'd like. In closing, I too would like to finally to thank those who work tirelessly in providing end-of-life care, whether they're in the Centre for Integrative Care, hospice staff like Bob Doris, I too have, have visited the excellent Marie Curie Hospice in my region here in Edinburgh, our NHS professionals, um, all of those who, who work in care, Scotland's many paid and unpaid carers, and I look forward to the Minister's comments on how we can progress these issues. Thank you. Just before I call uh, Richard Lyle, in view of the number of members wishing to speak in today's debate, I, I would be minded to accept a motion under Rule 8.14.3 to extend the debate by up to 30 minutes. And may I ask uh, Colin Smith to move such a motion? President, officer, I'm happy to move the motion. Are members in agreement? Uh, no one having disagreed, I extend the debate under Standing Order Rule 8.14.3. Richard Lyle to be followed by Dean Lockhart. Thank you, President Officer. Can I begin my remarks this afternoon by welcoming this debate on the Marie Curie Report and, of course, congratulating Colin Smith on bringing this important topic to the Chamber. I also wish to thank the Royal College of Nursing, Sue Ryder, Alzheimer Scotland and Marie Curie for their briefings. I pay particular tribute to the service in Lanarkshire, which Marie Curie provides 448 patients seen in 4,164 visits, 24-7 planned nursing service, 61 nurses in Lanarkshire, 93% of patients supported by Marie Curie dying in their place of choice. Other agencies do provide care in my area, but I know Marie Curie supports the people of Lanarkshire well. Marie Curie lives up to what I would suggest is its mission statement. Marie Curie is here for people living with any terminal illness and their families. Palliative care is wide-ranging. I want to focus on an area in relation to the topic that is of a particular interest to me, and that is dementia. Bob Doris spoke very well in his speech regarding his mum's dementia. Indeed, it must be noted that as life expectancy of people in Scotland increases, it is likely to mean that more people will experience dementia and the proportion of people dying with dementia will also grow. With that in mind, in November 2015, Alzheimer Scotland published its Advanced Dementia Practice Model, which sets out a model for providing integrated personal centre care for people with advanced dementia and at the end of life which responds to the complexity and the intensity of advanced illness and dementia. This model is due to be tested as part of the implementation of the Scottish Government's strategic framework for action on palliative and end-of-life care, a framework, framework which I not only welcome, 
but commend the Scottish Government on implementing to ensure that we are dealing with this, this sensitive issue in the way in which the Scottish people would expect. It is also important that we in this chamber recognise that many people dying with dementia will also have other conditions requiring a care response. Whether dementia is not only their primary concern, it will have an impact on their experience or other conditions in any treatment they, de they receive, and we must be prepared to deal with these situations. In the remainder of the time that I have in this debate, I wish to reflect in the, also on the Scottish Government's work in recognising the development nature of addressing dementia as it formulates health policy here in Scotland. This SNP Scottish Government published in March 2016 the proposal for Scotland's National Dementia Strategy, which was framed through the stakeholder engagement to identify the key areas that this Government can deliver for those with dementia. This strategy identified through stakeholder discussion that the Government should continue to focus on our national and local human rights based approach to improve dementia diagnosis rates and services and supports at all stages of this illness and in all care settings. And, that, and this should continue to be underpinned by the right-based approach to developing and upskilling the dementia workforce through implementing promoting excellence and the standards of care for dementia in Scotland. This is an important issue as framing our action on dementia within a rights-based approach is absolutely the way in which we must take these matters forward. This, I believe, gets to the heart of what Colin Smith's debate today is about, inequalities. And if we are to adopt a rights-based approach, then we must continue to address such inequalities. Therefore, we know the issue of dementia and palliative care are deeply underpinned by the need to enshrine human rights as a fundamental pillar to what being done. That is why the integration of the advanced dementia pro practice model by the Scottish Government into the Scottish Government's strategic framework uh, is so important. It recognises that human rights are a fundamental aspect to understand the citizenship and the rights of peop people. In closing, um, I want to conclude this afternoon President officer, by once again thanking Colin Smith for bringing this important issue to the Chamber and indeed allowing me to reflect on the work that the Scottish Government is doing in dementia care and how we can continue to work together to improve the approaches that are undertaken on this most important of issues. Thank you. I call Dean Lockhart to be followed by Monica Lennon. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I would also like to thank Colin Smith for leading this important debate on Marie Curie and the report on challenging inequities in palliative care. As Donald Cameron said, I, I would also like to uh, thank and recognise Bob Doris for his personal and powerful uh, contribution in this debate. Uh, this debate gives us the opportunity to acknowledge and appreciate the invaluable work performed by Marie Curie nurses, staff and volunteers on behalf of everyone who has received their assistance, including people living with terminal illness, their families and loved ones. Equally importantly, this debate gives us the chance to highlight some of the challenges that Marie Curie has to address going forward, in particular the various barriers certain groups in society face in accessing palliative care. Despite the wide, uh, widespread recognition and deep appreciation of the palliative care services that Marie Curie deliver, the fact remains that there are still uh, some 11,000 people who need palliative care in Scotland each year, but who don't benefit from it. In other words, as Colin Smith highlighted, one in four people die in Scotland without end-of-life care that they need. To address this gap in palliative care, research commissioned by Marie Curie has highlighted the inequality of access to that care across certain groups in Scotland. The fact is, Certain groups of people receive less palliative care than others with a comparable need. As others have mentioned in this debate, this includes older people, uh, black, Asian and minority ethnic groups, LGBT people and people living in deprived areas. Another group that doesn't receive the palliative care required are people who have mental health conditions. Vulnerability to mental health issues is significantly uh, increased for people living with a terminal illness, and this can often go untreated and unsupported. Uh, people often develop mental health issues as a result of their terminal illness, and there are many people suffering in this area who are not getting the support they need. And this was highlighted to me uh, as a major, major challenge when I spoke to Marie Curie earlier this week. It's therefore increasingly important that we ensure there is a range of support available for those who need end-of-life support. This includes access to psychiatrists and counsellors, 
as well as su suitable uh, medication. It's also crucial that we see more support for families and carers of people with a terminal illness and the further integration of health and social care services. On the issue of integrated health and social care services, I'm pleased to highlight the success of a Marie Curie hospice at home pilot that has recently been implemented in my uh, own region of Fife. This pilot in Fife was introduced to complement existing Marie Curie services and it has three key elements to it. First of all, a managed care service with nursing care for patients and carers, which is uh, what most people associate with, with Marie Curie. Secondly, uh, and this is where uh, it, it's an innovative scheme, uh, it also offers a fast track discharge service, which includes emotional support and practice assistance following a patient's discharge from hospital. And thirdly, the Marie Curie helper service, providing companionship, emotional support, and practical information by trained volunteers. All of that together is a very powerful uh, service, I think. This hospice at home service in Fife provided over 4,000 visits per year and meant that many more patients were able to return home from hospital in their final days. Uh, I don't want to quote numbers here, but I think it's uh, important to highlight that 74% of patients were able to leave hospital under this uh, pilot scheme compared to 30% previously. And I think everyone will agree that, that that's a great uh, improvement. Uh, the Fife Hospice at Home Pilot, I think, is a great example of integrated health and social care. And I would commend everyone at Marie, Clay, uh, Marie Curie involved in this uh, pilot scheme. And I hope that this can be expanded to other areas in Scotland. It's a testament to the hard work and forward thinking um, of everyone at uh, Marie uh, Curie. Let me conclude, Deputy Presiding Officer, uh, by again thanking Colin Smith for bringing this important debate to the Chamber and also, as other members have said, uh, let me extend my thanks and best wishes to everyone uh, across Scotland in providing palliative care and uh, their valuable and invaluable support in this area across Scotland. Thank you. The last of the open debate speakers is Monica Lennon. Officer. I would also like to echo colleagues in welcoming the opportunity to have this debate today and pay tribute to my colleague Colin Smith for raising the important issue. The Marie Curie report on challenging inequities in palliative care is a welcome and sobering recognition of the problems many patients face when accessing palliative and end-of-life care. I feel like I've learned a lot already from colleagues' con contributions today, particularly uh, thanks to, to Bob Doris, but also for, for the briefings that we've had from Marie Curie, from the Royal College of Nurseries, Hospices UK and others. We know that deeply entrenched inequalities unfortunately exist in many areas of life right across Scotland and deprivation is often the major precipitating factor that affects this. People from deprived areas already suffer from disproportionate health concerns and access to health and social care services. Sadly, this is no different when palliative care is considered. Despite the fact that people in Scotland's poorest communities are much more likely to have numerous hospital visits to require palliative care and die in hospital, areas with multiple deprivations have fewer referrals to palliative care service, even when similar diagnoses are made compared to less deprived areas. This is troubling and I support the calls from Hospices UK and others for more support to be given to improving the data on the barriers to care that people experience. It's equally concerning that the report highlights the existing patterns of discrimination experienced by black, Asian, minority ethnic people and LGBTI people, as Colin Smith and others have highlighted, can contribute to the lower levels of palliative care received within these groups. And more research does need to, to happen to allow us to better understand this problem and how it can indeed be solved. And I think Elaine Smith made a very important contribution highlighting the, the needs uh, of, of babies and, and children and young people in, in particular. Dean Lockhart just touched on it, but I think it should also be reinforced that a significant issue in palliative care is the consideration of mental health. The report notes that at least 10% of suicides are linked to a terminal or chronic illness. In addition, those living with severe mental illness tend to die earlier than the average population, and existing mental health issues can be made worse by physical illness. Mental health can affect those living with a terminal illness in a number of distinct ways. Mental ill health problems such as depression and anxiety can of course be triggered by the diagnosis of a terminal illness and in turn make physical conditions worse. 
There is also a wider issue regarding the mental health of family and carers through the course of their loved one's condition and subsequent bereavement. Palliative care is a holistic treatment is well placed to be in keeping with approaches that treat mental health in parity of esteem with physical health. But any approaches to improve the inequity of provision should be mindful of this going forward. I hope the Scottish Government will be mindful of Marie Curie's calls for a fourth stage in the mental health strategy for dying well, to ensure that patients, carers, family and friends are given adequate support throughout the patient's condition and subsequent bereavement. Those who are dying with a mental health issue can often be overlooked as part of the conversation, and I hope that's something which will change with the forthcoming strategy. In order to make these changes, there are a number of steps which can and must be taken if we're to achieve the vision set out in the Scottish Government's framework for action on palliative and end-of-life care, that everyone who needs this type of care will receive it by 2021. And many of these have been outlined by Hospices UK. Presiding officer, I'm mindful for time and there was more that I, I wanted to say, but I, I appreciate time has been extended already today. Again, I'd like to pay tribute to local hospices in, in my area, uh, South Lancashire Kilbride Hospice, as my nearest hospice, Elaine Smith has mentioned, uh, St Andrews. Um, I think we all appreciate the fantastic work and, and the fundraising that goes on as well. Um, but I'll finish then again, thanks to colleagues for, for their contributions today. And I call on Aileen Campbell to, to close this debate. Around seven minutes, please, Minister. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And like others, I also welcome the Enough for Everyone report produced by Marie Curie and thank also Colin Smith for bringing forward this motion and other members of the Palliative and End of Life Care Cross Party Group eh, and other members more generally for their contributions to the debate this afternoon. And I think the openness of this debate perhaps is in contrast to the fact that as a nation we are not often great at discussing death and dying. We're often reserved and private, which hasn't helped us to face the certainty of the death that all of us know, we know and love with the clear-sighted and practical compassion that it calls for. I'd also like to particularly thank, as others have as well, to uh, thank Bob Doris for his contribution and the openness about the recent passing of both his parents. I'd also like to thank as well Alison Johnson for her remarks and again agree with her that this debate fits well in with the empowering discussions that uh, our medical services need to be having with people as part of that realistic uh, medicine uh, approach. The findings of the Marie Curie report are important and will help us all, I think, move forward on our shared vision of ensuring that everyone, including those who have not been accessing palliative and end-of-life care, do indeed get access to it. The demand for good person-centred care is growing. We have more people in Scotland living longer, and that is a good thing. But as we grow older, more of us grow frail with multiple long-term conditions involving specific palliative care needs, needs, needs which, which the reports show are not always being met. Now, we do want a fairer Scotland, and this report reminds us of the challenges that we face and which we are taking concrete steps to address, that rights-based approach that Richard Lyle uh, described. We are committed to understanding the needs of our different communities and we want to eliminate discrimination, reduce inequality, protect human rights and build good relations by breaking down barriers that may hinder people and prevent them from accessing the care and the services and the supports that they need. Our strategic framework for action on palliative and end-of-life care was published in December 2015 and it set out our vision that by 2021 everyone in Scotland will have access to high quality palliative and end-of-life care which is tailored to their individual circumstances. Support that meets the, meets the needs of their point of needs, wherever that personal situation or individual characteristics may be, it is what each of us would want for ourselves or those we care about. So a tailored approach is absolutely critical if people are to have the benefit of high quality palliative and end of life care, regardless of their age, their mental health points that were made by Dean Locker and Monica Lennon, their wealth or poverty or where they live. And any response to the needs we face will require meaningful engagement with local communities and with our Scottish society as a whole, building on the undoubted assets and strength that we have across all of our communities. So it's therefore essential that we create the right conditions nationally to support the local communities in their planning and the delivery of palliative and end-of-life care services to help ensure that the unique characteristics of each individual are met. And that's reflected in our framework for action, which contains a series of commitments to help improve palliative and end-of-life care in ways that are sustainable and work for both the Scottish population as a whole and for those groups identified in the report. 
And we've already done much national work to facilitate and support the local planning of palliative and end-of-life care services through the integration of health and social care, one of the most significant reforms since the establishment of the NHS. Uh, integration authorities bring together NHS boards, local authorities and others to ensure the delivery of efficient and integrated services. Such services, including palliative and end-of-life care services, are commissioned in response to the needs and the choices of people and communities based on real local understanding and flexibility. Key to the success of this work is the ability of integration authorities' power to drive forward real change. And they'll manage more than 8 billion of resources that NHS boards and local authorities previously managed separately, representing more than 50% of territorial health board expenditure and more than 80% of local authority social care expenditure. And with a greater emphasis on community-based and more joined up care, integration aims to improve care and support for those who use health and social care services. And this will help better equip providers of local palliative and end of life care to meet the unique needs of each individual in their communities. That compassion that's been so evident in the services discussed and described by Donald Cameron and Elaine Smith and many others. And that innovation that I think was felt in the description of the fast track service that Dean Lockhart spoke about in his remarks. And as set out in our strategic framework for action, we have asked Healthcare Improvement Scotland to test and implement improvements in the delivery of palliative and end of life care. And this work includes developing better ways to identify all those who might benefit from palliative and end of life care, especially the frail and the elderly. Now to date, five integration authorities, including Glasgow City, East Ayrshire and the Western Isles, are collaborati collaborating with Healthcare Improvement Scotland's Living Well in Communities and focus on dementia improvement teams to take this work forward. But of course, data is vital. Without it, we won't know whether people are get, indeed getting the palliative and end of life care that they need. And that was a point that was made well by Bob Doris. Without it, local communities can't commission services to meet their people's care needs and care plans remain hard to share. This data challenge is also recognised in our framework for action, which includes a commitment to support improvements in the collection, the analysis, the interpretation and dissemination of data and evidence relating to the needs, the provision, the activity, indicators and outcomes in respect of palliative and end of life care. Our working group is tasked with clarifying the data requirements to ensure that they are valuable for both individuals receiving care and also to assist integration authorities in planning, commissioning and improving their local services. And working with NHS Information Services Division, the data group are also investigating a number of areas where data collection can be improved. And this will include exploring avenues for improving the data available relating to specific groups of people, including those that were identified in Marie Curie's report. Yeah, briefly. Yeah. Elaine Smith. Thank you, President Officer. I thank the Minister for taking the intervention. I just wonder, difficult though it, it, it is to discuss, would, would that also include a particular focus on children and young people from deprived areas who, who do seem to be a particular group that are not accessing appropriate care? Aileen Campbell. I'll certainly take on board the points that the, the member makes, uh, certainly from a previous portfolio as well. I know that that'll be work that might be of interest as well to Mark Macdonald in the early years. And I know that through that portfolio, there is an awful lot of uh, support for likes of cruise bereavement counselling and others as well. And recognising also, I think, one of the things that struck me in that time in that post around the support that siblings require. Um, if there is a, a death of a child as well, oftentimes they're the ones that are um, sometimes overlooked in the support that's required. So I think there's a whole, whole host of other areas that we probably need to have an attention and focus on, uh, particularly around uh, child uh, bereavement and child death. And it is difficult to talk about, but I don't think that's anything, any excuse to shy away from the realisation that we always need to do as much as we can. And I think the GERFIC, um approach is probably quite appropriate for, for this uh, and the points that Elaine Smith it raises uh, as well. Uh, and finally, in the moments I've got left, um, Presiding Officer, I want to turn to the values and the skills that people need from our health and social care staff. And I started at the start, and as others have said as well, that how far, how hard we find it as a nation to discuss death and dying. And yet it's a skill at having these difficult conversations, which is absolutely critical for anticipatory care planning conversations. Having these conversations and sharing what matters to the person at the end of their life can make all the difference to how and where they die. 
Um, this demanding and challenging staff development need is reflected in our framework, which contains a commitment to support the development of a new palliative and end-of-life care educational framework. NHS Education for Scotland, NES, are working with the uh, SSSE to develop a consistent approach to workforce learning and development, development and to sharing practice right across uh, the country. And lastly, I just want to say a bit about palliative and end-of-life care research. I think that was a big focus of Colin Smith's uh, remarks. And as part of the framework uh, set out in our as part of the programme of work set out in our framework, we have established a research forum that will complement the aims of the framework. And we've provided funding to support the group uh, to undertake a system systematic review of over 400 relevant research studies to help us develop a clearer picture of research and data gaps and to support improvement. And uniquely among the devolved nations, the Scottish Government has also committed funding for a strategic collaboration with Marie Curie. And this funding supports a call for research projects addressing priority areas addressed by the James Lind Alliance Priority Setting Partnership in Palliative End of Life Care. Two research projects to date have been successful in obtaining funding and these will be announced shortly. Uh, all of these will be helpful in realising the vision for palliative care, adding to the existing evidence base around palliative and end of life care. So in closing, presiding officer, I again welcome the opportunity to respond to this report from Marie Curie and naturally welcome Marie Curie's support for the government's strategic framework. But to close with the words read by Elaine Smith that we all, I think, can unite behind, you matter until the end of your life. Our job now, though, is to make that a reality. Thank you. This meeting is suspended until 2.30 p.m.